A necropsy is a systematic examination of the organs of a dead animal to determine the cause of death or to examine the pathologic changes present. There are many different necropsy procedures used, and all of them have certain advantages and disadvantages. It is strongly advised to always use the same procedure and the same order when examining the organs. This practice will ensure that the entire carcass and all organs are examined by the pathologist or veterinary practitioner. Although a proper necropsy takes time, a thorough postmortem examination is the best use of time when investigating the cause of death or clinical problems, and shortcuts taken during the necropsy procedure often cannot be compensated for by additional ancillary tests. The necropsy procedure presented in this video is used at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine for routine diagnostic investigations and teaching. Our technical staff often assists with opening of animals and removal of major organ systems. Pathologists are responsible for examination and interpretation of changes and for diagnosis of disease. External examination. Before starting the necropsy, the pathologist must read the complete clinical history, including the signalment of the animal and the clinical problems. Special attention should be paid to questions raised by the submitter. Record identifying tags or tattoos and color patterns of the animal. Weigh the animal and determine the body condition and nutritional status. Evaluate hydration status based on the skin turgor test and appearance of eyes. Examine the limbs by visual inspection, palpation, and flexion to detect potential fractures and joint disease. Examine the foot pads and toenails. Thoroughly examine all external orifices and associated structures, including the lips, tongue, teeth, oral mucosa, external nares, as well as the eyelids, conjunctival mucosa, eyes, ears, mammary glands, and perineal area, including the anus and external genitalia. Special attention is paid to the color of mucosal surfaces and presence of changes such as exudates, erosions, or vesicles, to name a few. Examine the quality of the hair coat and skin for the presence of alopecia, pustules, erosions, ectoparasites, and other changes. Also evaluate the symmetry and abundance of muscle mass. Reflecting legs and skinning. To reflect the left forelimb, make an incision into the skin medial to the left elbow Continue cutting the muscles between the shoulder and the thoracic wall and reflect the forelimb dorsally. To reflect the left hind limb, make another deep incision into the medial aspect of the left thigh along the shortest line connecting the left stifle with the anus. Open the coxofemoral joint and sever the round ligament. Then examine the synovial fluid and reflect the hind limb dorsally. To skin the animal, make a ventral midline skin incision over the sternum and extend it to the chin. While doing this, also reflect the skin dorsally by separating it from the underlying fascia, beginning at the chin and continuing along the intermandibular and cervical region. Then continue the ventral incision caudally along the left side of the mammary gland 
or external genitalia. Similarly, reflect the skin from the thorax and abdomen as far as the dorsal midline. Care must be taken to avoid puncturing the abdominal cavity at this time. Removal of the tongue and trachea. To remove the tongue, cut along the medial aspect of the ramus on both sides of the mandible, from the level of the mandibular angle to the symphysis, extending this cut into the oral cavity. Pull out the tongue caudally and sever the cartilaginous joints of the hyoid apparatus on both sides of the tongue. With caudal traction, dissect the trachea and esophagus from the cervical muscles until the level of the thoracic inlet, but do not open the thoracic cavity at this time. During this process, examine the tongue, palate, lips, teeth, oral cavity, pharynx, larynx, thyroid and parathyroid glands, as well as the jugular and carotid vessels. Examination of the subcutis. Assess the color and hydration status of the subcutaneous tissue and the abundance of fat reserves. Look for evidence of edema in dependent areas or for the presence of subcutaneous hemorrhages that can be associated with trauma, coagulation disorders, or endothelial damage. Examine the lymph nodes, exposed joints, and muscles, and make additional incisions in masticatory, cervical, or other muscle groups if needed. Opening the abdomen and thorax. To avoid lacerating the viscera, carefully incise the abdominal muscles at the posterior edge of the last rib on the left side and extend this incision ventrally to the xiphoid process and dorsally to the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebrae. Continue this muscle incision caudally along the ends of the transverse lumbar processes until the tuber coxae, and then ventrally towards the linea alba in the inguinal area. Before opening the thorax, first assess the presence of negative pressure in the thoracic cavity by evaluating the tonus of the diaphragm and by observing diaphragmatic collapse after perforation. In addition, the sound of inrushing air may be heard. After that, make a semilunar cut along the edge of the ribcage to detach the diaphragm from the left side of the thoracic wall. Using bone cutters, cut the costal cartilages close to the sternum and cut away any remaining soft tissue attachments. Then cut the ribs close to the thoracic vertebrae and sever any remaining soft tissue attachments. Now reflect the left thoracic wall and examine the parietal pleura. examination of the organs in situ. Once both the abdominal and thoracic cavities are opened, visually inspect the exposed viscera. If needed, review again the clinical history and collect samples for microbiology before palpation, manipulation, and contamination of tissues. Examine carefully the position and the potential misplacement of organs. Because once they are manipulated or removed, this crucial information may be lost. Examine the volume and the surface of the lungs. 
open the pericardium and examine the amount and quality of pericardial, pleural, and peritoneal fluids. Removal of the spleen and optional ligatures. To prevent spillage of gastrointestinal contents and contamination of organs, optional ligatures may be placed on the esophagus, duodenum, and rectum. The first optional tie may be placed on the esophagus cranial to the diaphragm. The esophagus is then severed cranially to this tie. After that, the omentum and spleen are removed. Then, the next two optional ties, approximately two inches apart, may be placed caudal to the entrance of the bile duct in the duodenum. The duodenum is then severed between these two ties. And finally, the last two optional ties may be placed on the rectum and the large intestine is severed between these two ties. Removal of the thoracic organs. Grasp the previously dissected tongue, trachea, and esophagus and remove them together with the heart and lungs as a unit by combined caudal traction and dissection along the spinal column and sternum. Severing the aorta, vena cava, and esophagus cranial to the diaphragm will permit removal of the pluck from the thorax. Next, find and remove both adrenal glands. They are located cranial to the renal veins. After that, proceed with the removal of the gastrointestinal tract. The patency of the bile duct is examined first, and then Usually, the stomach and the intestines without the liver are removed in toto. With this approach, optional ligatures of the GI tract are usually not needed because the cardiac sphincter of the stomach is strong enough to prevent spillage of stomach contents and rectal contents are squeezed away from the point of incision to avoid fecal spillage. In this video, however, we present an alternative approach for the removal of the gastrointestinal tract, which preserves the attachments between the stomach and liver. In this approach, first incise between the two duodenal ligatures placed previously, then sever the mesenteric attachments of the duodenum and stomach, and finally remove them together with the liver and attached diaphragm as one unit. After that, incise between the two ligatures placed on the rectum and remove the small and large intestines as a unit by cutting through the root of the mesentery. Removal of the urogenital tract. In cases with urogenital problems, an intact urogenital tract is removed after opening the pelvic cavity. However, in cases where urogenital problems are not suspected, the pelvic cavity is usually not opened, as is the case in this video. In the intact female, first locate and then remove the ovaries, uterine horns, and uterine body by severing the suspensory and broad ligaments. 
In the intact male, move the testes from the scrotum and spermatic cords from the inguinal canals into the abdomen. Dissect the penis towards its ligamentous attachment at the caudal aspect of the pelvis. It is useful to examine and open both kidneys in situ before removing them. If hydronephrosis is present, removal of the entire urinary tract is strongly suggested to find the site of obstruction. If hydronephrosis is not present, the kidneys, ureters, and bladder are removed without opening the pelvic cavity. Opening the joints. Remove the skin over several joints and open them carefully to minimize contamination with bacteria. Once opened, Assess the volume, consistency, and color of the synovial fluid and the appearance of the synovium and articular cartilage. Collect samples for microbiology if needed. After opening and examining the joints, remove a femur and set it aside for further examination. Removal of the head. To remove the head, first locate and open the atlanto-occipital joint. Once opened, then sever the ligament of the dens and the spinal cord and examine the cerebral spinal fluid. Then cut the joint capsule and ligaments between the atlas and the occipital bone and cut through the muscles, ligaments, tendons, and skin to detach the head. Examination of the carcass. Examine and section several external and internal lymph nodes. Also examine opened joints and exposed and severed muscles.
Finally, remove a single rib and examine its strength by breaking it. Examination of the pluck. Examine the tongue, tonsils, pharynx, and larynx. Then locate and examine the thyroid and parathyroid glands. They are located caudal and lateral to the larynx. Next examine the bronchial and mediastinal lymph nodes. <laughs> 